What's going on, everyone? And welcome to another episode of Writing Friction. And as always, today's guest is pretty cool. Everyone say hello to Brian Broom. How are you, Brian? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Michael? Not Michael, Michael. Michael. Mike, motorcycle. Michael, Michael Motorcycle. He was making fun of me before the <laughs> podcast started. And I said, that's what my mother used to say. And I think I'm 30, almost 34. And she still will say it to me from time to time. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I have, I have an old Jewish mother from the Bronx, so she will, uh, she'll do it all. So I grew up in Jersey, but we were talking before the podcast, you're from Ohio originally, right? Yeah, I'm from a little town called, well, uh, a little town called Braceville, Ohio. Um, and then we moved to uh, the big city, which is Warren, Ohio. Um, it's like, I, I don't know if you know anything about Ohio. It's I like do. right outside of Youngstown, if that's okay. any. Yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, North yeah. North. Um, yeah. can you be can you give me a geographical area eastern pennsylvania i'm, I'm sorry ohio um give me a little more geographical northeastern pennsylvania okay. yeah yeah um, you know like we used to go to cleveland to have a big night out like yeah just yeah, okay. drive up to cleveland yeah if you're driving to cleveland for a big night out you're not yeah it's not a good thing but i yeah, I, I, I told in bands forever you might be able to see behind my head there's some guitars hanging up and oh, yeah. uh, Ohio was always the one state that no matter what, you never drove over the speed limit. It was always that one state people always talked about. They're like, if it's 55, don't go 56, you're getting pulled over. Really? <laughs> yeah, I never, yeah. I never got pulled over in Ohio, and I was always flooring it. <laughs> oh, man, you be in a van, dude, with a friggin' trailer behind us. Who knows what the fuck else is in that van? And all our friends, in the, we'd be playing a show in like Cleveland. We played in Akron a bunch, uh, where the black, oh, yeah. black, the black Keys are from Akron. So I know Ohio. Yes, I, I went to uh, college at the University of Akron for exactly one, well, one semester, I think it was. And then I was okay. like, I got it. It's the rubber capital of the world. Did you know that? Akron, Ohio? Akron, Ohio. Or maybe it used to be, but at one point that was on like, you know, everything that you would get from Akron. Oh, We're the rubber capital of the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, well, growing up, what was your life growing up in Ohio? I mean, what was the vibe like there? Well, I mean, Ohio is a, you know, it's a complicated thing. Like you always hate the place you grew up. Well, maybe not everybody, but like, you know, all I ever really can remember about Ohio is that I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here because it was just like a small, you know, small town kind of, uh, you know, a small city. And then uh, Warren, Ohio, um, it was, you know, like a lot of places around in this area. It was like steel mill driven, um, you know, a lot of working class. And I just felt at the time like, oh, I can't, if I stay here, I'm going to die. So um, when I was really young, like 18, I moved uh to Akron and then that didn't work out. Um, and so I was gonna get as far away as I possibly could. So now I live in Pittsburgh. <laughs> that was as far as I got. Like, uh, I think I had like 300 bucks and I was like, I gotta get to the big city. So now here I am in Pittsburgh and I stayed so, here, I like this. All right, well, okay, well, let, let, let's kind of pull the camera back a little bit and maybe focus in a little more. Um, during those travels, I mean, what was your life like? I mean, were you a good student? Were you? fucking around i mean how did you you know were you taking class what were you doing how did you pursue writing at all were you doing any writing back then um i used to write when i was a kid and then you know as i was growing up and i used to i used to always sort of be in these corners like writing and like people started telling me like what are you doing like you're supposed to it wasn't a really accepted thing where i'm from for like you know a boy to be sitting in a corner like writing and people kind of thought it was weird so i stopped writing um i did i did well at school i think in the beginning you know but then i think in high school i was just like fuck this i don't i hate everybody here i hate this town and i i think i sort of uh i stopped and i sort of started acting out a little bit so i don't know i don't know I don't know like what my GPA was in, in high school. I just don't remember like doing very well or being very interested in what I was being taught in high school. When you say acting out in high school, I mean, there's various ways to act out in high school. The way I act out in high school was by playing punk rock music, skateboarding and smoking weed. Um, yeah. I don't know, did you have a similar acting out? What do you mean by acting out? Well, I didn't smoke weed. I hadn't, I hadn't found drugs and alcohol at the time. I think I, but I, uh, I did a lot of, um, oh, what, what was I doing in high school? Dear God, it was so long ago. I'm like 90 years old, first of all. You gotta be, you gotta be patient. Um, 
I, you know, I got in a, a, a few scrapes, like yeah. just, you know, my hormones were burgeoning. I'm, I'm a gay man. So there's no way to like get that out. Like you, it's not like you're going to the prom, you know, yeah, back course, in, yeah. like, in the 1980s when, you know, when I was a kid, like, yeah. um, I think I just did a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, um, self harm. Like I, I was trying to like hurt myself in a lot of ways. Um, and that was, you know, and that just caused people to think I was more strange. Most you know? definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, did, were you, was college an insight for you? Did you want to go to college? I wanted to go to college simply as a way to just get out of my hometown. Yeah. So that's why I tried Akron and Akron did not work out because, you know, in my coming out process was very painful. Like the first time I tried to come out, like somebody, which is in the book, like somebody like stopped me. You know, um, and so what do, you, I was, what do you mean by that, though? I mean, I, you don't have to give it away, but I mean, is that a common occurrence? I, I don't know if it is anymore. You know, I look at young gay people now and I'm like, you know, gosh, you're really, you know, a, a lot, a lot more kids have parents who are understanding and accepting. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, you know, even as not that long ago as the 1980s, we weren't in that place. Um, and so when I went to college, you know, I, I joined a gay and lesbian organization. Um, and then, you know, my, uh, my roommates found out and that was just a whole thing. Like I just decided to like, leave. I was still ashamed, yeah. um, you know, at that time. So I just decided to like run and then I ran to Pittsburgh. So when you went to Pittsburgh, so did you drop out of college? I mean, did you? Yeah, okay, I yeah. just, I, I was, I went AWOL. I just left, you know, yeah. um, and then I hung around back in my hometown for a little while. And then I was like, I got to get out of here again. So I decided, okay, I'm just going to go to Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh was where, you know, the world lit up for me because I found yeah. like, I found people who were like me. I found, you know, a group, uh, a group of young people who were out. And, um, and so that's when I started just really doubling down on the party. <laughs> uh -huh. Is there, is there, I'm not too familiar. I mean, I live in San Francisco, right? So obviously, you know, we have the Castro. Is there a gay neighborhood in Pittsburgh? Oh, some would say Shadyside is a little area called Shadyside. Shadyside? Yeah, Shadyside uh, is like a, you know, I guess an affluent area. But I don't know that it's, I don't know that Pittsburgh has a, a gay neighborhood. Yeah. Like, you know, there are little pockets, you know, all over the city, but not a, not a gay neighborhood. Yeah. Like Pittsburgh's well, gay scene is, uh, is pretty scattered. Mm -hmm. And what was, the, was there still a coming out process of that when you were coming into Pittsburgh? It seemed like you kind of, when you got there, you said you kind of doubled down on the partying and shit like oh, that. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that's also something you write about in the book. Um, yeah. Could you, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, break it down to us. Well, I mean, know. I found drugs. I mean, I found like people- What were you experimenting drugs. with? Had you ever experimented with drugs ever before that point? Not until I got to Pittsburgh. Like I, you know, I was pretty, uh, I hadn't drank in high school like a lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Akron, I hadn't drank. No, I got to Pittsburgh and I found, first I found booze, of course, which is where we all start. Um, and then- I didn't I start found, there. I didn't start didn't? that hall. I started smoking pot. I, I grew up, see, I grew up in a family of pot smoking people. Not like, not like hippies. And, but no, they, my parents never drank ever. I've never seen my dad drink more than half a beer but i've seen he can smoke an ounce of weed in a day so <laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah i uh no my parents never drank either but like as soon as i got drunk for the first time i was like this is perfect uh -huh. because it just kind of like deadened all my like anxiety and you know and then i started i started drinking more and then i found cocaine um which yeah oh god did I find it it kept, and then it started finding me it was really weird like um, and I was like this is this is perfect like so and then the cocaine in my mind allowed me to drink longer and it just became this you know and when you're young I guess you know <clears throat> that's kind of what you do you experiment with that kind of stuff but my uh, attachment to cocaine and alcohol and then later on like opiates like it it became something else. Like first it was about partying. Um, first it was about like having a good time, but then it was just like, you know, it's Thursday afternoon and I got nothing to do. Then it was like, I'm feeling stressed. I'm gonna, you know, and then it just became every day, all day long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And when all my, when, when my friends were kind of like, you know, this is about, you know, when you get older, like my friends were kind of like finding careers and getting in relationships and having kids. I was still doing that same shit. Like I was still drinking every day. I was still, you know, were you working? I worked, I managed to, I managed to keep a job. Um, I did, I managed to keep a job. I don't know how I did it when I look back because, you know, there were, I had like cheap. A, that's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I would go to work with, you know, for, on no sleep, like just, just from the night before, just go straight into work. Like there's one, I mean, I was able to keep a job. I have no idea. I think in some instances, like, my bosses just liked me um, and they let me like, you know, just hang on. They'd be like, oh, that's Brian. They knew you, you were know. fucked up? I don't think they knew I was fucked up, but I think they knew that I wasn't performing well. Um, what, what were you doing? What, what was the job? I used to work a lot of like office jobs. I worked, yeah. well, first of all, my first jobs were waiting tables. And yeah. when you're waiting tables, like as long as you can get to the table, so nobody cares if you're fucked up. fucked up with that job. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then I started working like just a lot of customer service jobs, like, hello, this is Brian. Thank you for calling. How can I help? You know, that kind of stuff. So you can limp through that if you're drunk. Um, but in some, in some cases, my bosses were like, they liked me and they were just like, oh, well, that's Brian, you know? And then um, as time went on, you're not able to pull that off anymore. Like, you know, you just, I was just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So um, I lost a couple jobs. Um, because of my drinking and my drug use. Um, and yeah, that doesn't feel good. So then what do you do? You drink and you drug more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, at the time, could you, I mean, it's easy to talk about now because it's in the past, but at the time, were you cognizant that it was, it was a, becoming a, I mean, a snowballing effect that it was only getting worse and worse? And did you know that if you kept doing it, like you said, opiates, I mean, was that the next progression after cocaine? I mean, again, yeah, drug, you know, yeah, tell it, tell us. Yeah, I, I, I had no idea. Like, people were starting to tell me, like, Brian, look, dude, like, you got to get it together. And, and in my head, it was their problem. They just couldn't, you know, you know, like a lot of addicts, you know, it's not, this isn't my problem. It's your problem. You know, it's Michael's problem. It's my boss's problem. My boss is an asshole. You know, my friends are being dicks. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely couldn't see that it was like me. And I was a fairly horrible person, like just selfish. And, and uh, um, you know, I allowed my own pain to become something that everybody else had to bear. Um, so I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of, you know, in my addiction, when I would run out of money, I'd steal it from sometimes from friends. Like, yeah. so yeah. it was pretty bad. It was yeah. pretty bad. I mean, you mentioned the Thursday afternoon, you got nothing to do. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up, you know, you know, since I was, 16, 15, you know, playing shows, playing in band. I mean, you know, so I've seen drugs in various ways, just and all that kind of shit. And I've been around, you know, and I'm maybe partaking on those Thursday afternoons. And it's just kind of like, you know, it's two in the afternoon. You're like, I got nothing to fucking do. Right. But I got that sitting over the oh, shit. And that's, that's what it is, right? I mean, right. especially with a drug like cocaine, um, you know, that, I've never, I've never experimented with opiates personally, but I've just experimented with cocaine and that drug, the power behind these drugs is so, I mean, just talking about it, like makes me jittery, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like talking about it, like, you know, I, I, there was a while when I couldn't talk about it. Like when I came out of rehab, um, I, when I came out of rehab, I didn't go anywhere or see anybody, like, because I was so afraid that I was going to relapse, you know, but I had gotten to the point where it was like, I would wake up in the morning and like, I didn't have breakfast, you know, I didn't like do yoga. I didn't do, I mean, I went straight for the bottle, like in the morning yeah. um, and whatever blow I had left over from last yeah. night, which was rare that I had any left over. So these were just like days, you know, um, that I would spend just in a stupor and still working, still managing to go to work, you know. Um, were you doing any writing? No, God, yeah. no. I didn't start writing again until I went to rehab. Really? So then was there a final moment that kind of, was there a bottom? Yeah, it was an intervention. What, what put you into a rehab? Was it, have you multiple stints or? I had, um, I've done a couple, 
I've done a couple of psych ward rehabs. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, there, there's been times when things got really dark and I went to the psych ward and they were and within like a psych ward, they would have like a rehab thing. Um, and then I would just come back out and do the same thing again. Yeah. Um, there was no real intervention per se, like a friend of mine, well, <laughs> okay. So uh, I spent the night, this is, okay, this is a, I'm gonna tell this story. Yeah, sure. Um, I met this dude one night at a, at a bar and he was just as fucked up as I was, right? Yeah. Um, and we decided we were gonna like go home together, right? So to get to and his, he was like, my house is within walking distance. Um, and we started walking and we were so fucked up, we couldn't get to the, his place. So we literally like, we ended up in this person's backyard and this person had like a dog in a dog house, like in, in this backyard. We were literally like rolling around on the ground. Like, and this dog was just like, I don't know what the dog was just like, what the fuck is this? Like, he's like, um, can I join? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I don't know how, like, this was like, you know, it was really like late, 3 a.m. or something yeah. like that. So the people didn't come out. Um, the dog didn't, the dog kind of barked and growled a little bit, but nothing really happened. And then like, I, the next thing I know, I was waking up in these people's backyard. It was like the next day, right? And I told somebody that story and they were like, that's not funny. Like, first of all, you know, anything, you're a black man, like, rolling around in somebody's backyard like you woke up this person whoever you were with wasn't there i, I was gonna um, ask was the other dude there when you woke no, up yeah no he was gone yeah um and yeah if he, if he woke up he's like i'm out <laughs> yeah he was like i'm out of here i don't know yeah. if he tried to like wake up I'm going to yeah exactly like to get refreshed <laughs> after this you know and a friend of mine was like that's not funny and then from from then i started thinking about it and then one day um another friend of mine was just like dude here's the deal if you don't go get some help like don't don't call me anymore like do not we are we are not friends anymore like yeah. you're too much to deal with um and so i went to rehab just as a way to kind of like shut everybody up look at me i'm going to rehab of my yeah. own volition you know and when how i come old, out i'm sorry how old were you at the time oh god we have to talk age um i was this i've been sober for eight years so i'm so maybe 42 Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So you're being relatively young. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. no, no. I was old. I was like 42 years old. I mean, I had spent... Oh, I think you said 22. I'm sorry. No, no, no. 42. Like this Got was, it. I've only been sober for eight years. Mm, okay. Um, and I'm 51 now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Damn. And uh, <laughs> if you're 51, I will, by this camera, I'm 187. So yeah, you're, you're, you're killing you it. Don't worry. Michael, you got to find that little enhan enhance your, uh, appearance button on zoom they have it's something like that well to be honest if i went like th there's I'm, i have these blood and the sun is pouring into the apartment right now so i'm uh, you look you look, yeah you look magnificent don't worry about i it. appreciate that uh, <laughs> so yeah i just went you know i went to rehab to just show everybody up and then while i was there you know i was just like and i started actually started listening to what like the counselors and the people at rehab and you know other people's stories in rehab um and it it took like i was like i gotta i gotta do something so i started writing um again you know i used to love to write when i was a kid and then there was this whole blackout period where i didn't write because i was just fucked up all the time and then i think the minute i got like sober um and the minute they put like some antidepressants in me um, I just immediately started writing again. I've had some people in my family who have experienced similar similar things like this. Um, you know, I have a sibling who at 16, they were, you know, my parents hired people, three people in the middle of the night came in, took her out of her room, sent her to fucking mm. Arizona, all these things, right? Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. But that being said, as an adult, enter the program let me ask you this question um with more maybe obviously wisdom and experience you said you started listening do you think if this had happened to you like i said maybe when i misheard you at an earlier age of 22 25 do you think you would have taken in all that info at the same time are you happy it maybe happened to you later in life or 
Well, I think about that a lot, actually. And I'm really kind of like mad at myself that I feel, I feel like I've wasted so much time. I was just having this conversation in my head the other night. I was like, Jesus, Brian, you're fucking, your life's over, half over. Like, you know, now you're getting your shit together at 51, right? A little bit. Anyway, it's not totally together. But then I thought, you know, but if I had, this couldn't have happened to me at any other time. Like, if somebody had told me at 22, you know, you need to go to rehab, I would have been like, absolutely not. Like, absolutely not. Um, so there's no other way that it, I wouldn't have listened to when I was 22. Uh, I wouldn't have listened when I was 32, you know. Um, it took till 42 for me to listen um, and to really take in what the, you know, the, the counselors at my rehab were saying um, and really listen to other people, you know, who were there getting treatment themselves about their stories. Because what I found is that, you know, I'm not unique in any way, shape or form. Like the stuff that I was feeling um, the stuff that was making me drink, the anxiety, the depression, the, you know, the self-hatred, like none of that stuff is unique to me. And I was thinking, you know, I have to drink and do drugs because I, you know, have a lot to block out, you know, and I'm not unique in that. Everybody has stuff that they want to forget. Um, so I think once I realized that and also realized that, look, dude, you don't really know how much time you have left. You may as you, you already know what drinking and drugs do. They don't make anything better. So why not just not do that anymore? Yeah. And see what happens, you know? What you just said kind of hit a point with me. Uh, you know, we're, we're recording this on a Monday. So yesterday I was watching, uh, I just had some time to kill. I was on a YouTube kind of rabbit hole. And, um, you know, Chris Farley, right? Yeah. They uh, put out a new hour and a half documentary about him. And I, I, I'm a big fan of his. I read all the books and stuff like that. But at the end of it, very end of the documentary, one of the people they were interviewing was John Goodman. Um, you know, the actor John Goodman, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess he had a big time drug problem uh, himself and has been clean for a long time. And they're filming him. And at the end of him being interviewed, you know, they, they, you know when it's supposed to cut off, the cameras keep filming and he takes off his like, you know, live microphone. He stands up, he starts walking away. And one of the boons catches him and he just starts going on this rant about like how he's like, amazed that he was able to even get out of drug addiction. And for people who don't know, Chris Farley died of a drug overdose, uh, you know, yeah. an acid drug overdose. Um, but he got, you know, again, older gentleman as well when he got clean and sober. Um, you know, as someone I can't speak on, I, I smoke pot like a chip, like a chimney. Um, but you know, people call that California sober. I, I've been hearing this term. <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to expel anything that, that that's not true. But when you were writing this book and when you started drafting, were you talking about it to anyone? I mean, was this something you did, you know, was it part of your treatment plan? And how did, you know, what, what, what did it start with? It started because, you know, this literally is how I, like, I started writing again. Like I had this roommate, um, he was a big guy um, and he snored like he's like a fucking motorcycle. He just, he had that CPAP machine, right? And like, he also had trouble sleeping. So they would just put him on these drugs that would knock him out, right? And then his CPAP machine would like slide off his face and then he would just start snoring. Right. So I couldn't sleep. And so they give you this like pad and paper, you know, uh, at re in rehab, you're supposed to write down your epiphany. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'll tell I'll, I'll tell you when you go to rehab, I'm not saying you're going to go. Yeah. Um, but when you go to rehab, they give you this pad. They give you a pad and paper or the one I went to anyway, gave me this pad, give everybody this pad and paper to write down your feelings and whatever. So I just started writing on this pad and paper. And what I started writing was like, I asked myself, like, why am I here? Like, what, what stories do I remember most of all in my life that kind of like put me here? And that's where this book started, you know? Um, you know, stories from when I was young, stories from when I, you know, it was in my 20s and 30s and, you know, 40s and on, right? So that's what started it, like, and what I realized was like, you know, a lot of my addiction is wrapped up in these stories um, and so those are the stories, some of them didn't make it into the book, but like, um, those are the stories that I remember 
Um, those are the stories that made me uh, want to forget who I was or like pretend to be somebody else. Um, so that's where it all started. So it wasn't, so I guess it was part of my recovery. I, nobody made me do it. I just took it upon myself to be like, I'm going to write stories about why I've ended up in this, in this place. Did you find that it kind of started flowing out of you pretty easily, pretty quickly once you started getting you know, the pen to the paper? No, God, no. Um, it was hard. Like I, you know, uh, some of the stuff I didn't want to put in the book, um, I would, you know, my writing style literally is like, okay, I have this great story in my head. Okay. 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 And so I write right where I'm sitting. Like usually when I'm writing, I sit right here where you see me now and I live upstairs. Um, and by the time I get from down upstairs to here, like the whole story is gone. Like, and so I just sit you know, staring at a blank screen, you know, for a long time, but then it comes and I work on it. Um, I work on a story until I'm, I'm like, okay, not no more today. Um, and then I think about it, but I think about writing all the time, like all the time. Are you a big reader? Kind of, uh, not as much as I should be. Yeah. Um, you know, right now it's kind of hard for me to read because I teach, um, at the university of Pittsburgh and I got a lot of students and, um, and then there's the book and doing stuff, you know, so I haven't had time to just, that's what I plan to do this summer. Like, uh, I plan to just like, nobody fucking bother me. Like, I'm going to like, read not your book, uh, right? Yes. I'm going to read my book over again. No, God, no, God, no. If I, I told you that, that, if I told you that we had some people on this podcast who have posted Instagram photos of themselves reading their old books, I, I wouldn't be lying. So. I'm going to add myself to that list of people. I'm going to be sending you a picture of me reading my book as soon as we're done here. Uh, well, I started Isabel Wilkerson's um, cast. Um, but again, I can't, I don't really have time to sit down and enjoy it. But yeah, this summer, yeah, yeah, yeah. I promise you, and anybody watching this podcast, I will be, I will find a hammock. I will find a fucking hammock and I will find two trees close enough together uh, to put a hammock in, I'm just gonna read because that's. Well, it, uh, well so you said Pittsburgh. Well, you said Pittsburgh. I, I guess you're in Pittsburgh right now. That's where I you're am. From. Um, I've been to Pittsburgh once, maybe two times. Um, I'm a big fan of the band Fish, um, and Fish plays in Pittsburgh quite often. So I've done you... the Pittsburgh, but I haven't been. It seems to be kind of on the on the up and up now. It seems to be things are. More coffee shops are popping up and things like that. Uh, yeah. Have you seen that city change recently? I have, like, and particularly since I've been in an alcoholic stupor for a long time. Like, so, you know, I don't, a lot of stuff is gone. Like, a whole neighborhood has near me has been like gentrified. Yeah. Like, um, uh, a few neighborhoods have been gentrified, and I think a few are in the process of being gentrified. I've seen a lot a lot change in the city. I, like when I was, like when I was younger in Pittsburgh, like it was dirtier, you know? I used to call and, it Pittsburgh. Yeah. <laughs> Come on now, that's not fair. I can't be that's the only person. person who's ever said that. Because yeah, I know. Some people who live here still call it that, but yeah. like. Um, I'm from, I'm from know. New Jersey. But I mean, let, let, let's call oh. it what it is. Yeah, you can't talk. <laughs> but we're like a, you know, we're a steel town, you know, uh, that has just, you know, and then the steel industry kind of went kablooey. And like, so I think uh, a lot of Pittsburgh, we've had to like readjust and yeah. and things have changed. And so, yeah, there's a lot of like nice coffee shops and, you know, the cost of living is good. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a good town. I don't know if I'm going to stay here forever, but it's a good place to live. And uh, what are you teaching? You said you teach? Yeah, I teach at the University of Pittsburgh. I teach uh, Introduction to Nonfiction. Uh, okay. So, yeah, most of my students are uh, 18, 19. It's crazy. I'm like, I can't even believe you guys are full of hope and optimism and all of mine is dead. Like, God bless you. Um, so, yeah, they're good kids. Like, uh, and I enjoy teaching a great deal. What, what, what would an intro to nonfiction student be reading? Well, I had them read. Well, since now everything's on Zoom, it's kind of hard to like get into things. So are I you still? Them... Oh, the classes aren't open yet. Still, I, I'm so yeah. I don't even. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I taught last semester. I taught live, 
Uh, this, uh, this semester I'm teaching over Zoom. Um, is that what you're so referring like, to it as live? What, Zoom? No, you said let, you said you taught live and now you're on Zoom. I'm saying live, is that what people are referring to it as now? When first <laughs> yes, that's why people, that's what like people music, are calling it. Live music. Yeah, yeah, live teaching now. We have live teaching. Uh, so I was in class, in a class with actual students last semester. This semester we had to do it over yeah. uh, Zoom. I'm giving them like, there's a really great piece by B Domino. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but uh, she's a writer uh, who used to be a stripper. Okay. Um, and I'm she in. has this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she has this, she has this great piece called The Champagne Room. Okay. And it's oh, yeah. just her writing about these things that have happened to her in champagne rooms. Okay. Uh, yeah, you gotta club. send me that. I, I would read that for sure. You should definitely read it. It's should we have so her on the podcast? Good. What's that? Should we have her on the podcast? I think you definitely should. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I don't know if she's written anything else, but yeah. that piece, like I gave it to my students to read because I thought it was so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rachel Cusk outline. Um, what else? Some James Baldwin. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been giving them a lot of stuff. I had them listen to a few like um, uh, podcasts. Um, what was the last one? I can't remember. I give them good shit to listen. To. Yeah, yeah, no, most definitely. most definitely. Yeah. Well, dude, Brian, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. Um, we haven't even said the name of your book. Please tell people the name of your. Oh my book. God, <laughs> my name is Brian Broom, everybody, and my book is called "Punch Me Up to the Gods." Um, it's a memoir about growing up uh, black and gay, and all kinds of things uh, in Ohio. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, buy it, and I hope you read it, and I hope you yeah, like it. Without a doubt. Um, and I always ask two questions at the end of these. Uh, first question being, you do any social media, Twitter, Instagram, anything like that? Where can people follow you? Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, uh, I refuse to do Twitter. It feels like just a hate machine. Twitter um, is the most garbage place you could ever spend time in. <laughs> It's, uh, somebody asked me if I wanted to get a Twitter account one time, and I was like, it looks like a, just a hate machine. So I, I don't have Twitter. I have Instagram. Um, B-B-R-O-M-B-A is my Instagram name and just a Facebook, Brian Broom. Dope. And uh, you're a Pittsburgh guy, Ohio guy. Uh, what bookstores do you like to rep? Where should people buy your books from? Oh, White Whale. The White Whale Bookstore. Uh, independently owned bookstore in the Bloomfield area of the city. Um, they are magnificent. They've treated me really, really nice. I know the owners um, and they're great people. So yeah, white whale. Hey, Brian, absolute pleasure, man. Best of luck with everything. And I'm sure we'll talk. If I'm on fish tour, I'll give you, I'll hit you up. Later. Oh, please stop by. Please Without stop by. Yeah, no, and we'll make sure you're me. high as fuck when you do. <laughs> we'll, we'll hang out, Brian. Don't worry. Right. <laughs> later, you have a great one, man. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Bye.